Hello, and welcome to this lesson on the biological terrain. Uh, this is episode two. If you missed episode one, I'll link it in the description below. But what is biological terrain? Well, basically, there are two theories about health, why we get sick, uh, how we get healthy, uh, those type of things. The first theory is the germ theory, which was developed by or promoted by Louis Pasteur, who was a chemist scientist uh, living in uh, the 1800s um, in Paris. He also had a colleague by the name of Antoine Beauchamp. Uh, Antoine uh, believed in the biological terrain. And I find the gardening and taking care of your body works hand in hand. And we are, we were lost in an era where we believe that you uh, sprayed chemicals, you did fertilizers, you did everything chemically, uh, and it was all about the production. But now we're getting into the understanding in permaculture and organic gardening that it is the soil that we have to pay attention to, so that if you don't have a good, healthy soil, how can the seeds and plants develop into healthy produce? So there is quite a similarity, and that's why gardening with granny meets health to home. So how we go about that is one of the reasons I'm presenting these videos. Hi, <laughs> I'm Mary Bourne. I'm a traditional naturopath and I love sharing natural remedies with people. Natural remedies have been around for thousands of years because they work. So we got caught up in the chemical revolution, so to speak. And you can choose whether you feel this is um, a good thing or a bad thing or whether we've actually progressed or not. Um, in the first class, I went over the fact that I'm 80 years old. I've seen a lot in my 80 years. When I was a kid going to school, we never saw people, the majority of children attending those classes were uh, healthy and strong. They weren't overweight. They didn't have an abundance of allergies. Um, so let's look at what's happening now. Nowadays, there's a children's hospital in most large counties. Oh, well. I mean, to me, that's an oh, wow moment to think that we need whole hospitals dedicated to children. I think we need to take a, a deep dive into where we are, how we got here, and why we need to do things a little differently. We did that with soil. People are learning every single day. People are realizing the importance of creating healthy soil. And if you really want healthy food, that's how you got to grow it in good soil. So the biological terrain helps us to understand that our bodies are very much like the plants that grow. And if the body is sick, we invite disease. Same thing as a plant. When a plant is about to die, the insects take over. It's, it's what happens in nature. 
you get parasites, you get um, animals, critters, all kinds of things that want to break that, that uh, uh, unhealthy body and break it down and make it go away, <laughs> bring it back to the earth. So in today's class, we're going to talk about, um, let me see if I can get this. I just have trouble with that. There we go. So just as a recap, the biological terrain is the internal environment. It's our lymphatic fluid and how healthy that lymphatic fluid is, um, whether or not we are drinking enough water because that the lymph is our fluid. And if we're not drinking enough water, the fluid will actually dry up. If we're not taking in enough minerals and nutrients, then the fluid is not going to be healthy to actually support the cells that live within the community of the lymph system. So it can be likened to the soil in which a plant grows. The health of the soil determines the health of the plant. And as long as biological terrain is balanced, cells will be healthy. So it's just that simple. We also looked at the disease tree and we could treat all of the diseases. We could take medication for constipation, for acne, for colitis, for backache, whoops, <laughs> go back here, for chronic fatigue, low thyroid, but look at all the medications one would take. And the fact that these medications have never been tested in combination. They've been tested by themselves. They've been tested in a Petri dish. They've been tested on animals. But animals do not have the thinking brain that humans have. And we understand how stress can affect our bodies and the placebo effect and the nocebo effect, those all interplay. So I like to look at the trunk, which is considered the biological terrain, and the soil, which is our constitution. How much toxic overload do we deal with? How much physical trauma? How much uh, unresolved trauma and stress? And are we nutrient deficient? These things are basic. This is what we have to figure out. And that's our starting point, not the condition, which is the end point of why we got there. So in today's class, we, we actually kind of stepped on this a little bit at the last class. So we're talking about the metabolic rate. So this is the heat and cold. So if the body is running hyperactive, it's irritated, and overheated, we call that hot. If the body is hypoactive or depressed or reduced in temperature or uh, any of these cold type um, symptoms, then where the metabolic rate is slow. So then there's the tissue density. So we're talking about the ratio of fluid and mineral balance. So how thick is the lymphatic system or mucus that the body is dealing with? And um, if you're dealing with dampness where you're having swelling and moisture and too much oil, you know, you have oily skin and uh, you're, you're puffy. Or are you too rigid or dry? You're constantly lathering on the lotion. You don't have enough moisture. Your skin is cracking, um, itching, those type of things. So those are the two things that we look at, hot and cold or damp and dry. 
So what are the health problems involved in irritation or heat? So there's acute injuries. And I did a class on first aid. I'll link it in the description below. That really talks about, it was a six episode series that talked about scrapes and burns and cuts and bruises and all the things and how you can work with those. It really is a helpful understanding of what to do in case of a uh, 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 an acute injury that generally can be dealt with at home that you don't need 911 to assist. There is a definite place for medication. Don't get me wrong. But I think it's used far too much, far too frequently. Um, and it's not, it should not be the first choice. So in fevers and sore throat and earaches, uh, pain after injury or surgery, these are all things that there are herbs that do help and herbs assist in healing. Drugs actually control the injury. So there's ulcerations, there's all the inflammatory Diseases like arthritis, bronchitis, tonsillitis, appendicitis, gastritis, laryngitis, all the itises um, are inflammation. Now, uh, arthritis means inflammation of the joint. Uh, bronchitis is inflammation of the bronchioles. So um, now, you know, they use the itis to indicate inflammation. So then there's irritation, which is heat. Now, increased metabolic rate is uh, heat is an indication of increased metabolic rate. And the classic symptoms of inflammation um, is heat, swelling, redness, and pain. And a lot of people will take medications. Now, a lot of people will take it prophylactically. So in other words, they'll take an aspirin before they go out and uh, rake leaves. You know, uh, aspirin is a powerful medication and it has been known to cause ulcers. It will cause bleeding ulcers if you use it too much. It causes perforation of the tissue. It is not something you want to take on a daily basis or even proactively. You can take supplements proactively, but you cannot take medications proactively. That's not proactive. According to the CDC, the number of people who died from a drug overdose in 2021 was over six times the number in 1999. People are just too easy, easily persuaded or encouraged, whatever that indication is. Um, we're using medications too much. The number of drug overdose deaths increased from Oh, more than 16% during that time. And over 75% of the nearly 1,007 drug overdoses, 107,000, I'm sorry, 107,000 drug overdose deaths in 2021 involved an opioid. How did we ever get there? Most of the time, it was done innocently enough. It started with an injury that needed medication, but the person continued to take the pain-relieving medication far beyond necessary. You know, we do often have to deal with pain. <clears throat> it's part of life. So
what's the choice? What's the choice? What do you want to do? You know, really, it is up to you. I'm not preaching to you and telling this is what you have to do. I'm just saying that if you choose to find another way, you could study all the herbs and all of what they do and take classes in, in herbal preparations and that, or you can have an understanding of how herbs work, how your body works, and what you're looking for as far as a category rather than just a single type herb. We're going to go over some single type herbs, but I think that it's important for you to understand how they work. So inflammation and pain go hand in hand, and you can find this information on uh, this um, cdc.gov. I've uh, attached the link in the description below, and you can look for it there. So an analgesic is something that kills pain, basically, or numbs pain. There are lots of them out there. There are lots of drugs that are painkillers. Alcohol can be a painkiller, but you often do yourself a lot more harm by taking these than if you were choosing something herbal. So an herbal option for uh, controlling pain or actually just helping your body deal better with pain is um, salicylates. Now salicylates is where aspirin came from. It came from white willow bark and they made a drug out of it. And then the, you know, there's only a certain amount of years that a patent is good for and then it becomes readily available without a patent or it's called over the counter so um aspirin you know and, and they say baby aspirin so let me tell you there's no such thing as a baby aspirin because you would not give a baby aspirin so there are salicylates that have the same action without the harm of aspirin. Um, there's meadow sweet, there's willow bark, and there's winter green. And we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, later. There are opioid like, so the California poppy, Cordialis hemp, you heard of um, CBD, um, you know, all all during the time where everything was shut down due to COVID, the CBD joints, places where, you know, you could buy marijuana readily available here in Michigan. Um, they didn't shut that down. So they, <laughs> they shut down all the restaurants and all the good places, but no, not that place. I mean, not that... There isn't a place for it. It's just that I don't think it should be your go-to place. Find out what's causing the pain. What's causing the inflammation? You know, if you keep hitting your thumb with the hammer and you're trying to take an aspirin because of it, that makes no sense. So what are you doing that may be contributing to your pain? Look at your daily activities or inactivities. See if you could maybe change something. So there are others that are food type that you could be taking on a daily basis. Now, I don't know if I would want to do capsicum or clove on a daily basis. These are spices and they should be used in little 
amounts, not large amounts. But turmeric, there's a lot of people that take turmeric and curcumin on a regular basis, and I'm one of those people. I like the fact that they help me with inflammation. And how they help me with inflammation is important. The same thing with ginger. Ginger is a marvelous herb. If you have um, upset stomachs where you want to um, vomit, ginger is very settling. It's very warming. Um, if you have uh, travel problems or seasickness or any of those type of things, uh, ginger is very beneficial for the stomach. There's also anti-inflammatories. Now, uh, many people take anti-inflammatory medication for joint pain. Um, that it all comes with some warning. Um, hydrocortisone and prednisone, read about them because there's a, a, a real concern with using too much of them. And if you understand how your adrenals work, your adrenals put out cortisol. Now, cortisol is where you get cortisone or hydrocortisone or prednisone, that's what they're all based on. So, and ibuprofen and Advil and Motrin, we've seen uh, some really bad side effects from people who have taken them uh, on a regular basis. So uh, my preference is, is a um, like licorice or yucca or wild yam. These are all very moistening and they soothe um, inflammation. And that's what you want. You want, you want some, not just to control it, but what can you do to make it easier on your body? It isn't about ignoring the pain. It's try to find out what the pain is, why you have it, and how you can support your body in uh, alleviating it. Turmeric, Boswellia, hemp or CBD, Magnus, uh, mangosteen, chamomile, cat's claw, omega-3 fatty acids, and MSM are also just a little example of the category of herbs that can be used as anti-inflammatories. Now, a lot of these have a crossover where they do both, such as turmeric, curcumin, is both anti-inflammatory and analgesic. They help to calm inflammation and therefore deal with the pain. Um, white willow bark and winter green, winter green now, wintergreen is an essential oil, and it is used topically, and it is not for children. Some of these, uh, you have to, like chamomile would be fine for children, but wintergreen is not. So sometimes you, children respond much quicker to herbs than adults do. Also note, if you are on medication, be sure to do your research because a lot of medications actually have problems with regular food like broccoli. And, and so you need to look at the medications you're taking and decide with your doctor what you can take. Now, a lot of doctors are not, they're not informed about herbs. And so they'll just say, no, 
but there are integrative doctors that now understand the benefits of taking herbs and they'll work with you on uh, reducing the medication or um, eventually moving toward taking herbs and they'll do a downstep program with, with you. But this, when you're on medication, you really need to be careful about what you're taking in. Now, I would just like to read to you <clears throat> some of the research on turmeric. Turmeric has been used for centuries in the Chinese and Ayurvedic systems of medicine, particularly as an anti-inflammatory and anti-arthritic agent. Modern research has shown that turmeric contains antioxidants known as curcuminoids, which demonstrate potent antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. Curcumin, the primary active, <clears throat> excuse me, ingredient in turmeric, um, has been known to com be comparable to NSAIDs, which is the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories that I showed you in the last slide, like ibuprofen and uh, <clears throat> Advil. They're due, these uh, properties are due to the curcumin's ability to protect DNA from breakage by singlet oxygen free radicals and inhibit the activity of pro-inflammatory compounds, including leucan, I can send you the article. <laughs> but it compared, in this study, it compared it to the COX-2 uh, inhibitors, and those are what are um, involved in ibuprofen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Use of curcumin has been shown to be safe in human trials indicating no dose limiting toxicity when administered at doses up to 10 grams. That's huge. That's not, most people would not need to take that much. Now, the product that I took when I was um, dealing with uh, double sprained ankles, in other words, both ankles were sprained. I crawled around the house. I took IF relief. <clears throat> I love it. Whenever I have a serious injury, it's my go-to. And in the beginning of the injury, I'll take uh, a capsule every hour. And then as things calm down, I take maybe a capsule three times a day. It, it, it has in it, um, in addition to white willow bark and turmeric, Boswellio, mangosteen, and andro Andrographis paniculata. Now, um, if you're interested in what this all uh, entails, you can email me at mary at bornforhealth.com and I will send you the article that I'm reading from. It is not on the web, and therefore I can't give you a link for it, but it is a, a very beneficial supplement that you use on acute conditions. Now, on an everyday situation, I use curcumin and turmeric because everything hurts when you're 80 years old. <laughs> you know, you your knees, uh, your hips, uh, all of that. So, uh, you know, you do, you have joint, joint pain. And I do try to eat properly, uh, drink enough fluids, that type of thing. Um, but if you're interested in either one of these two products, I'll leave a link in the description below, which will give you 25% off. Now, herbs do not do the same as drugs. Drugs are generally more powerful and faster acting, and there are times when herbs are not enough. And so, 
I can appreciate when somebody has to take medication. But the reason for this discussion is basically to let you know that, you know, when you have a little ache and pain, take something that is going to help your body, help it to heal and not cause more problems. The safety on herbs are amazing. After all, most of them have been used for thousands of years. So <clears throat> people use them because they found them effective. They didn't die right away. <laughs> they wrote journals on them. Um, it, but our government uses the same protocols for herbs as they use for food. They are food. Most of them are derived. Herbs are plants that grow. A lot of them we can identify in our own yards, but we don't know how helpful they can be. Like dandelion. How many people actually kill off all the dandelion when they should be eating it? It, it is a very beneficial herb. And we, we are taking a, a different view now. We understand about soil health. We are learning to get back to the old ways of treating things with herbs and supporting our bodies with better nutrition. You know, we've trusted in medicine for a long time, and it's important to maintain trust in doctors. But the pharmaceutical industry has infiltrated, and there's very little integrity now in the pharmaceutical industry. They just want profit. And that's an unfortunate circumstance. So I, for one, am very cautious about the pharmaceutical industry. I, um, I have talked to many, many people who are disenchanted with the medicine that they're taking and they want to find a different way. And yes, you like I said, you can pull up books and study all the different herbs and that, but I feel that the approach needs to be of understanding why you're doing something and look more at what the category is so that you're not stuck. If you can't get one herb, look for another. Look at what the properties are that these herbs are um, showing and go for them. So today we're talking about analgesics and anti-inflammatories. And next time we will talk about antidepressants and what category uh, what herbs fall under that category of antidepressants. It's a huge category. It's a huge problem. And there are a lot of things to discuss when it comes to anti-depression. Um, uh, Many things are not looked at. For example, the effects of low vitamin D on our, um, our emotions and our physical health and that most people are deficient in vitamin D. So that's one way of looking at it. Now I know vitamin D is not exactly an herb, but it is a nutritional supplement. It is something that I feel people need to know more about uh, and to know what their numbers are. So if you go and have a blood test, make sure that you're vitamin D is tested so that you know where you are within that level and what are the optimal levels. We're going to talk about that next time. So 
again, I'm Mary Bourne, traditional naturopath. I hope that this was informative, that if you liked it, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe. Um, share it with others because, you know, we all need to be a little more effective about our health. And this is one way of doing it. Um, I hope that uh, you attend um, next time for learning about antidepressants naturally.